First, I want to thank all of the presenters. Um, I think that it's, it's important to use what they've talked about as a reflection, not just on the complexities that we're dealing with very complex systems within communities after devastation, and that there are a lot of situational issues that have to be analyzed within the context of people who are really in need and who have been, have been displaced based on what the letter that was read by Ilya earlier. One of the things I, I think that's, that's very powerful, and there's, I'm gonna focus on the connective tissue between these presentations and also some of the things that I feel that I would like to have some answers to questions to. One of the things Hank said this morning was about taking time to think. And I think one of the things, and that's a very hard thing to do when there are people who no longer are in their homes. However, what I think has been incredibly successful and very important to remember in everything that was, that was shown this morning is that in really taking the time to engage communities in a, in a very meaningful way so that they have a part of a future of what their lives will be since they had no power over what's just happened to them is very important not just for the opportunity of redesigning and really looking to the future together, but from a policy and from a doing the right thing perspective, having these conversations really gives people a chance to think, to take a step back, and not in a way that they feel that they're not getting their funding fast enough, which is another issue, or that they're dealing with insurance, which is unwieldy, which is another issue, but that you as professionals are truly in partnership with them and allowing them to give voice, and you, from a technical perspective, giving them your expertise to be able to really physicalize what their thoughts are, what their ideas are. So I think that's very, very important to remember as we continue through this day, and we really look at how we're gonna deal with issues. Don, you talked about, you said this several times, that nothing was ever the same, and, um, and that's true. And with that comes challenges, but with nothing being the same comes tremendous opportunity. So one of the things I'd like to ask is, um, how would you take these challenges as lessons learned that you would share with some of the other communities of how we could take this kind of innovation and looking for best practices in the living laboratory programs you talked about is something that would be useful to other communities. The other thing uh, in what you talked about in Connecticut is uh, the Bridgeport region um, is a very diverse community, and it's very diverse from an economic perspective. So I'm wondering how you dealt with what is a very real economic disparities within the communities, because um, they are all neighbors to each other, and sometimes it takes a storm to really realize what you have in common with those neighbors, but it also brings up a lot of resistance and uh, a lot of um, history of what one had or what one didn't have prior to this. So I was wondering what you might share with us about how you dealt with that. Uh, Jack, Camp Osborne, um, I thought that what has been done has really uh, so beautifully um, maintained the intergenerational and cultural aspect of what was there. And it was looking at it in a different way, something that fit within the context of what the challenges are. But I think another thing that often gets lost that's very important to remember as, as practicing professionals has to do with the cultural aspects of a community and the fiber of that that can get lost in the transition, not only of being lost, but how do you rebuild, particularly when you don't as Don had talked about, know exactly where the floodplains are gonna be. So I'm wondering if there are some lessons learned that you could share with other communities and how you also managed to reach consensus as well as you did. Um, I thought that was um, uh, quite empowering and it's something I'd like to know a little bit more about so that other professionals in, the, in this room can learn from that. Brian. Uh, architecture for humanity is, is really grounded in something that's very close to my heart, which is communities at risk. And um, I think you've done an incredible job. And the mobile events and the centers and the Sandy Design Help Desk and the volunteer training, 
I think that all that is really important, not just for the marginalized communities, but for other communities, and having an understanding before disaster hits, but now having the context of where, th where they are and their vulnerabilities are, to be able to think ahead so that if something strikes, you're not looking around to say who's coming to help me and you're in a state of shock and you don't know what to do or who to call or, or, or you probably won't be able to call anyone. So I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about what you're doing in communities where um, they may not have been hit now, but they may be hit. Are there things that you could be doing with what Don is doing, let's say, in, in his work that could be advanced knowledge on the ground that will help people before disaster strikes? And if you're lucky enough to not be one of those people where disaster has struck, then you'll know what to do to help somewhere where it has. Um, let's see. Uh, also, in terms of architecture for humanity, I was thinking about, well, what's the follow-up? And how are you going to take this so that this isn't a program that just stops with, with where we are now? And um, how would you replicate it to other communities? And how are you going to really share the knowledge and communicate what's being done as this pilot program? Uh, prior to, again, other communities being hit by disaster. So what is, is there going to be a kind of um, a learning process that you're going to share prior to rolling it out? How public is the process going to be? That, that was a question I had. And uh, Greg, uh, the AIA Regional Recovery Working Group in Rhode Island. I think that what you're doing is something that needs to um, be in communities um, throughout this region. Because again, my experience post Sandy was being on the ground right after uh, the disaster and into mainly marginalized communities and, and people just not knowing even what the questions are to ask, not knowing who to look for for help. So I think when you're in a state of trauma, one of the things that will really help ground you and to be able to help your other members within the community before help comes in is to have the kind of advanced knowledge and education that the AIA Regional Recovery Working Group is, is doing. And I think sharing that with more communities is, is really um, going to help on the ground so that people can help themselves before anyone from the outside comes in. And a question I have for all of you is, let's talk about the youth. Um, because I, I didn't see uh, or hear anything that really addressed how all of these processes are being communicated to the younger people within the community. I know that uh, Hank talked about this, about the Harbor School, and, uh, and I saw this again from personal experience on the ground, that younger people, when a disaster hits, one of two things can happen. One could be traumatized in a way that you're continually re-traumatized and you, you develop fear. Or you could be traumatized and to take that trauma and to understand how you can be part of what can be a solution. So I'm just wondering, as you're doing your work in all these communities, how you are engaging the youth. And this is a particular question to our New England friends. Um, I know that we've been working very hard within New York and New Jersey to have more of a collaboration uh, between New York and New Jersey. And uh, my observation and, and, and research in terms of Boston is that there's been a lot of scholarly research, but there hasn't really been any action plan. So I'm wondering how Connecticut and Rhode Island, that you are actively engaged on the ground making things happen, um, how are you going to deal with um, the area of Boston that is a little slow in the uptake, but is every bit if not more vulnerable um, than, than your regions have been? And... Uh, lastly, there was something that's come up a couple of times in, in the talks this morning that had to do with um, getting through liability. And so I'm wondering uh, if there's an action plan um, uh, on a policy level 
where, where there's held up or as a professional community, what is the gravitas of really moving through uh, some of the issues of being able to be a first responder so that um, we all can take better care of each other. Thank you. Perhaps we could have the four panelists who spoke come up here and sit for a moment and we'll uh, do a little post uh, presentation conversation in the in the meantime so I don't forget Ilya and I had a, a great opportunity in uh, Florida at Disney World um, very much with the assistance of the folks from BASF and others to go through an exhibit that's been established there called Stormstruck where you sit in a uh, sort of a 3D kind of room and you're taken through uh, being at the center of a hurricane and they've had uh, a vast number of people come through there so far including a lot of children and it does represent uh, a, a, um, a simulation of something that you probably never want to experience for the first time without having had it simulated so you don't actually react in panic but with some uh, understanding and it does occur to me also that Jaime Lerner, the great uh, um, sustainability, urban sustainability mayor from Curitiba basically um, doesn't train adults, he trains six-year-olds to move into the world uh, that's coming at them uh, thinking perhaps the parents are not as uh, quick to respond and those children do more to teach their parents than their parents may do for the kids. And I think that Maxine's comment on that and, and, and I think uh, Donald's and others, it's, it's to the point. I mean, this is it, those folks. If we are gonna do, as I think a number of people have now suggested, uh, Hank um, more than ever, if we're gonna change the way things happen, we have to actually change the culture we live in and those who are already you know, deeply acculturated are probably a little bit more difficult to, to ask to adapt, but those who are not yet habituated to bad practice and bad habits maybe are susceptible to resilience and sustainability. So each of you, Maxine put a, a short question out for each of you, and I thought you should each take a moment to respond. To the mic, for your... I think. Um, I know you're filming it, therefore you like the mic. And Maxine did a ter perfect job. Uh, by the way, on Boston, but this, for those like myself, I'm more or less full time on this topic. Um, I'm a survivor of uh, the 1938 hurricane. Uh, Boston has an, Boston AIA has an annual conference, you know, and in, it, it runs for three days. It's it's pretty impressive on all issues of practice. That's where the Boston practitioners get their AIA and other credits. Uh, this discussion, which is just at the beginning, remember that curve, we were at the very beginning. Uh, I followed the curve of the energy movement that started in the 1970s, and you can see with the lead, what, 30,000 attendees at the last conference? So stay tuned, uh, resilience is the curriculum for the 21st century. Uh, Maxine's most difficult uh, issue, the nice one, regarding economic disparity in our community. So I'm writing, uh, and there will be a free public webinar about this. Uh, it has to do with the rules that we agree to and when we sit at the table. And at the Bridgeport example, the Greater Bridgeport Regional Council, uh, each of the towns has an appointee by the mayor. The mayor is essentially the titular representative, has typically appointed their engineer. So the engineer comes to our monthly meeting along with one other public sector representative and all public invitees. So at any one monthly meeting, there is two appointed and then additional um, uh, folks representing their communities. And yes, uh, one sees racism. Uh, one sees, uh, I'm not gonna share what we're doing in my town. I've got enough problems. Uh, and, and that's why I said the rule is, what can you do to help another? We have found, for example, uh, but we solved it's just one example, and then I'm off the stage. Um, the mayor says, why are you adding these problems? And I'm saying, no, we're not adding to the problem set. We're, we're increasing the solution set. So we looked at hazardous waste and waste management two years before Sandy and set up permitted collection sites for construction debris. It took several years to get them permitted, 
So instead of, as in the case of New York City, your damage went, uh, your, your uh, debris went into trucks, drove eight hours to Waterloo, New York, to the largest and only available landfill in New York State during those weeks. Uh, in Connecticut, they went to local construction sites where they created jobs. So that's just a little detail of why that um, discussion at the community level. And I think, Maxine, there are, there's, um, when, when we talk to one another as neighbors uh, and get to know the folks, um, that's the only way to overcome the economic injustice that uh, we talked about. So, uh, by the way, to get to replicable, once we've got it figured out, we'll, we'll share lessons. Thanks for the time. Just a, a, a little factoid from the New York Times article the other day about sea level rise in the Pacific. If you read it, it does look like now that the island of Tuvalu may well be the first to need to be evacuated um, because they, they will not be tenable. And Fiji is not far behind, but Fiji, um, and these are not the same government, but Fiji has offered to accept, I think, 100,000 uh, Tuvaluvians um, who may be displaced in the not so distant future, which I took as a, a very large gesture of regional cooperation. And it made me think about what in the future, not unlike what, what Don just referred to, might be the necessary displacement, as we know has happened in a minor way, on Staten Island of certain of our own communities, and what thinking ahead might be done in advance of that being absolutely necessary. So. Jack, you, please. Thanks, Maxine. Uh, that was uh, some good questions and clarifications. Um, using Camp Osborne as an example for other communities is a, a, a tough sell. Uh, the reason being that the property, it's 3.3 .3 acres and it's owned by an association. So each homeowner actually owned the sand underneath the footprint of their house which is approximately 600 square feet. So they were pretty restrictive of where we could go uh, with different options, uh, and that's why they were so anxious for the AIA to come in and help them with that program. Um, it would be, uh, you know, can you get a neighborhood to step in and do this? Yes, you know, but it would have to be, uh, like I said, it's with the association, it's already tough to get them to agree to do something in a positive direction. Uh, though the whole association agreed that this is what they'd like to do because their options were very limited. Uh, it, uh, I believe it came out as a, a beautiful uh, design. It makes great use of their, uh, uh, their wants and their needs uh, of the community. Uh, it pulled them back. Uh, they like to be able to sit outside and watch people walk by and say good evening, but then go into their own units. So uh, it, it's a very unique, unique uh, situation. Um, as far as New Jersey and uh, the youth, uh, one thing that uh, we have had happen is NJIT has been running an alternate uh, uh, spring break program. And uh, this year they, I believe, had uh, 300 people, students, sign up for it. And they go down and do different projects throughout the state along the coast, uh, rebuilding and uh, helping people uh, you know, just clean up after the storm still. Uh, hope that helps <laughs> answer your question. Well, Brian, you can perhaps respond a little bit, but while you're doing it, because your, your d delivery talked about doing work um, further afield than just in New York, um, a question I would put out to everyone during the course of the day is how, after we have a regional conversation, we can look towards uh, the availability or the creation of a regional authority that actually has the power to act. We have now a lot of consultant type regional plan, tri-state uh, organizations. But I think to make decisions that will now affect how the water flows against your shores when we bolster our shores and these kinds of decisions, I, I think we're not there yet. And so as we talk about the individual cases, that aspect of regional working, I think still has a ways to go and I just, going to look to what you have to say to how you deal with it. Sure. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Maxine, for, for your questions. Um, so 
where to begin? <laughs> um, the, the intent of the, the help desk uh, is to be replicable around not just the, the five boroughs of the city, but the region and hopefully beyond the, the tri-state area. And um, the follow-up to the questions and answers that we provide our clients during the initial Sandy Design Help Desk, um, our hope is not too dissimilar from what we've experienced um, post-Katrina with the Biloxi Model Home Program. We're working with uh, a private uh, property owner, whether they're commercial or, or residential in nature, coupling them with either a pro bono or low bono architect um, of local or national um, instance and um, creating a structure that is resilient and sustainable for years on years to come um, uh, how we how we replicate that I, I'm, I'm unfortunately not at liber liberty to talk about it too too much because it hasn't been uh, uh, the, the partnership hasn't been fully uh, formed not not just within uh, the the five boroughs but also with this national program between architecture for humanity and the American Institute of Architects, but that will be coming. I can assure you that will be coming. Um, in terms of the youth, um, just last week I spoke to my, uh, my five-year-old daughter's preschool class about architecture and resiliency and what I do in helping with the storm, but um, prior to that I also uh, taught with citizen schools as a volunteer uh, teacher teaching sixth and seventh graders about architecture and uh, the last two semesters specifically were, were uh, in teaching in the Bronx um, was about uh, resiliency. And um, halfway through our term last fall, the, uh, the, the storm in the Philippines happened and they had more questions than I knew how to answer at the time. So it was, it was very interesting to see how their experience with Sandy, which in the Bronx was minimal, um, how their thought process really happened with, um, uh, uh, with the Philippines. Um, so one of the questions that, that uh, Ilya had asked me to ask the group was, um, and Don, you sort of talked about this a little bit, um, if Sandy hit you know, nine hours either side of when it did um, and it affected being a, I grew up in Westchester right on, on, the, on the Sound Shore area, um, if it affected the North Shore of Long Island, Westchester, uh, northern edges of New York City and Connecticut, the way it affected the South Side, uh, what conversations would we be having? What's the discussion? So um, part of what we're going to be doing nationally is an hoping, hopefully answering those questions. Uh, taking a look at really the tri-state area from uh, really southern Maine all the way down to Washington, D.C. That's sort of the, the general area that, that um, I'm going to be leading. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Greg, want to have a, a, a last panelist word before we see if there are some questions from the group? Great. Well, Maxine, I, I like your comments. I think when you get to the rallying points uh, of a community and you talk about the youth, that's, I, mean, I think you can, it works both ways. You, know, you can do it, it can be a great thing because I found with the, uh, with, even with green buildings, uh, it's the kids that start asking the questions, are we doing enough? And it's parents that will do a lot of things for the safety of their kids. So if we play the safety card, uh, when we're trying to move some of these reforms through and, and we talk about the safety of kids, uh, it gives a lot more than just some architect saying, I want to redesign your community, which I have to say, people are suspicious of. They, they think we're just coming in just to make the world a more, you know, more architecturally beautiful place. But this is really beyond that. This is about safety. And we can play the safety card to the max and, and, and good design and safe design are, should be hand, you know, should be seen together. So I, you know, with that. I also, the other side of that was, we, on our group, uh, we actually in, have invited the architecture students to do this, 
to come on to our teams also. And so what we have is on the badging, we actually have tiers. Uh, so we actually have a student tier. In other words, so you're not a registered professional, but you can still, if you're in a curriculum uh, in design or structural engineering or architecture, you can go, you can be trained and then you can go with the teams. And we feel that's a bit more inclusive. It gets the whole, uh, it brings it out starting, um, I know at Roger Williams, they're now doing resilient design studio projects. You know, they go after, uh, they, they had one in Turkey about the sites of the Turkish earthquake. So it's a topic students rally around, students, and so I think there's, you know, the youngest students, the, I mean, the, the, the architecture students, we should be bringing in to this discussion. And of course, NIT, uh, NYIT is doing that. But I think the youngest ones are really our best allies in terms of getting people to change building codes. Because when you go to beach communities, nobody wants to build to the code. <laughs> but if you say, but, but what about the kids? What about the safety? I think you know, you're going to have some, some play there. Uh, and uh, regionally, we're, our thing about this training is, this ATC training, is we're, we're now starting to go around New England doing it. And the ultimate goal is that if, uh, if another big catastrophe hit, we would then be able to re have reciprocity where, uh, you know, we could, you know, Rhode Islanders could help Connecticut or New York people and vice versa. Because in some of these uh, situations, you could, you know, we could have, you know, we were up doing our bit, but we could have come down here, you know. And so I think that having a greater community, these kinds of workshops are what we were hoped would happen. So, and uh, like, again, liability, uh, all I can tell you is we, uh, we're happy to share our experience with you and you can show it to other people because we actually uh, are quite proud of this memorandum of understanding we got and uh, other states now are using it. And at the end of the day, it isn't, um, it should not be a deal breaker. It looks murky when you start, but once we sort of codified it, uh, it was fine. So uh, we're doing it with our urban search and rescue people. We're doing it with our building officials. So there's no reason why we can't, we can't get over this. That was our epiphany. So anyway, I think that's